Good morning. Education must stand on the side of optimism or else it will melt like ice cream in the surf. This quote is from Loris Malaguzzi, the founder of the internationally recognized early childhood programs from Reggio Emilia, Italy. I'm here today to speak with you about the convergence of three principles with the intent of shifting the current dialogue in education from one of finger pointing and blame to one filled with hope and possibilities so that we don't melt like the ice cream. My background is early childhood education, so I've had the privilege for decades now of learning from young children. And you know, young children come into this world naturally curious and not afraid to take risk. But all too often, over time, we diminish or take away those capacities from the children when we tell them there's one way of doing, one way of thinking. And we don't value their ideas, but rather, we value the answers that are scored and measured. As Ken Robinson said, we're educating people right out of their creative capacities. The first concept I'd like to explore with you is the image of the child. And that is a Reggio principle. It is the belief that all children are capable, competent, powerful learners who have multiple ways of knowing, thinking, doing, and interpreting the world. It's like David Garner was explaining the high expectations of the IB curriculum. But I'd like to explore this concept further with you through this piece of artwork that was done by a four-year-old child at the Butler University Lab School, which is in the Indianapolis Public Schools, an urban district. She's four, and she's not in a gifted classroom, but she's in a classroom that believes the image of the child. Now, you might look at this artwork and say, oh, isn't it colorful? But let me tell you what my dialogue was with this child. I said to her, I can see you used a lot of colors today. And she looked at me and she said, this is my work on shape continuity. <laughs> oh, I said, tell me about shape continuity. And she did. She said, you see, and I've tried to repeat this shape in different places, in different colors, in different directions. She said, you know, continuous. It goes on and on. Yes, that is shape continuity. Well, I had the good fortune about three months later to be in an art gallery of a local artist, and this child was in the group. And I see her engaged looking at this piece of artwork. And she turned and she looked at me and she said, you know, I think this artist knows about shape continuity too. <laughs> you see, there's the image of the child that her ability, her ideas are as worthy and that she can enter into the dialogue in this world. And it strikes me, why do we have children do silly things like gluing cotton balls on pieces of paper when they can do shape continuity? I don't understand. I use this phrase quite often with my students when we ask children to do things like cotton balls or just an activity to get an answer. Ours is, re ours is not to reason why, just invert and multiply. I mean, seriously, how many of us in this room know the mathematical reason of why you invert the fraction except that it gives us the answer? Well, recently, my five-year-old granddaughter was introduced to number lines, and I knew she was quite excited about this. So when I saw her, I said, I understand you're studying number lines. And in that wonderful, unfiltered way of a five-year-old, she looked at me and she said, you know about number lines? <laughs> and it reminded me of how different her learning experience is from my own. You see, I remember having a teacher who had us do this tedious task where each day we were given so many minutes to work on writing our numerals one to a hundred. This drug on for days and days. And I happened to be in my father's office, and I saw him write 10 line 20. And I asked him what that line meant. And he said, oh, it means, it's called a dash. It means all the numbers in between. And I thought, oh my goodness, my teacher does not know about this. <laughs> This is revolutionary. I am taking this to school. <laughs> so the next day, I got my paper out, and I'd gotten as far as the numeral 70, and I wrote, proudly wrote dash 100 and put my, teacher, my paper back in the teacher's basket. 
And she brought the paper over to me, and she said, what did you do here? And I happily explained with great pride about the dash. She looked at me, and she said, that is not what I ask you to do. You will start over. And she ripped my paper up. Apparently, she didn't know about the image of the child either. (laughs) But if we believe in a positive, powerful image of the child, as Trung Lee described, we have to think about the design of the learning environment. And he did a beautiful job describing the Reggio principle of the environment as the third teacher. Because when you see classrooms that are based upon a positive image of the child, they look markedly different from the classrooms that you and I experienced. They're not only aesthetically beautiful, but they are based upon an understanding of the intersection of time and space and relationships. And you see a different dialogue happening in this classroom. You hear teachers speaking more with questions than directions. And you hear the children speaking with questions, too. Lots of hypotheses going on, a multitude of ideas. And everyone embraces uncertainty. They live in the questions. As Dr. Louise Cadwell, an expert in Reggio, who's written many textbooks on it, said, it's about moving schools from being schools of teaching to schools of learning. As Frank Nuova said, design in its simplest form is the activity of creating solutions. I told the children today I needed a clipboard, a piece of cardboard, and a clothespin. Design in its simplest form. So you may be saying, okay, you know, I, I get the image of the child. That's important. You need to have a learning environment that matches that. But how do we bring about change in dialogue? Well, for me, the connecting piece was the work of Dr. Kathy Kramer on asset-based thinking. And she's a psychologist, and it is a concrete cognitive process in which you analyze assets, strengths, synergies, and possibilities. I will tell you, if you use ABT thinking and strategies, it shifts your focus and your thinking. Let me give you an example, something that you may relate to. I was in a meeting when an issue came up for the fifth time. Obviously, we hadn't resolved it. (sighs) I could be irritated and perplexed, or I could shift my thinking. So I used an ABT strategy, and I asked a question. I said, what would this look like if it was solved? What What would be the solution or solutions? And could we back map our way of how we would get there? Now, the first time you use an ABT strategy, you might get a reaction of, what did she just say? But I, t- trust me, if you continue on and help shift the thinking and the focus, the, the ideas and the solutions come forward. You see, I think we've lost our way because we have a double dialogue going on right now where we say we want 21st century learners, we want right brain thinkers who are creative and collaborative, but we have an obsession with testing and measuring. I don't know how you measure shape continuity on a standardized test. This child has multiple ways of thinking and doing. And as Malaguzzi said, optimism is important, but optimism alone will not suffice. It takes action. So my call to action for you today is how will you shift your thinking and your dialogue to bring forth all of the possibilities and the brilliance that lie within each of us because we must each support all of our capable, competent children. Because in the end, all children are our children, and they deserve the best. And the best are the solutions within each of us. Thank you for this opportunity.